I've had a really, you know, diverse, varied career. Um, Mary described it very generously. But I mean, if someone would ask me, you know, what's your profession? What do you do? I would say I'm a political scientist. I mean, that's what I consider myself to be. I'm a political scientist. That's what I was trained to do. That's what my graduate degree is in. And that's what I consider myself as, as far as, you know, my profession um, to be. And I went to work uh, after graduate school at George Mason University to teach at George Mason I, in the political science department, the government department there, American politics. And that's what I studied. And really, when I came to George Mason, I thought that's where I would be for the remainder of my career because it was a great job. I was working right outside of Washington, D.C. at an R1, you know, Research One University. I was teaching exactly what I studied. I was teaching the presidency and and the Congress and other institutions. I had a great um, a group of colleagues around me at George Mason. There was really uh, no uh, nothing that uh, had went wrong in in my career plan. I, and then I decided one day to uh, take a fellowship, pursue a fellowship with the American Political Science Association to work uh, on Capitol Hill for nine months for, for a year, take a, a year's leave to do that, because I had decided I wanted to become a political scientist when I was an undergraduate. And I really had pursued that goal almost relentlessly from the time I was, I don't know, 19 or 20 years old until I accomplished that and ended up at George Mason. And I had never taken any time, any time off or any time in particular to actually work at any of the institutions that I had studied. So worked in Congress or not in the White House, certainly, or in, in any federal agency. Yet I was teaching all these terrific students at George Mason, both undergraduates and graduate students, who had this whole wealth of experience of working in politics, working um, in Capitol Hill, working some of them in, in the White House or other associated executive branch agencies. And I just had that missing link um, when I was teaching them and communicating with them the importance of these institutions. So I thought it would be really helpful for me to take a year's leave and, and pursue a fellowship with the American Political Science Association, which is an established fellowship that's existed for many, many decades. And that was really, as I've told some students here today and faculty, that was really a pivotal decision. I didn't realize it at the time, I thought I would do the fellowship and then come back and continue on my route at George Mason. I had already picked out what my next book was going to be and what I was going to work on. Um, but I really, you know, surprised myself when I went to work in Congress, when I went, I worked in the Senate, and how much I enjoyed working in public service, how much I liked uh, the efficacy of, of that type of work. I felt, you know, a sense of relevancy in some ways that I hadn't necessarily felt before, not that I was irrelevant in, in, in doing my previous job, but there was this immediacy to some of my work. And I got caught up in a few policy issues that I was working on that I, that, um, I felt like maybe I could perhaps make a difference in some of the work that I was doing alongside the people uh, that, that I was working with. And that ended up just really changing my career because I stayed on Capitol Hill for a little while. I left George Mason, uh, stayed on Capitol Hill for a job, and then Went to work at the Library of Congress, at the Congressional Research Service. I remained at the Library of Congress for 12 years, for over a decade, um, and then went to work at the White House Historical Association. And really, if I hadn't gone to work at the White House Historical Association, I don't think I would have become the archivist of the United States, because that's how I got on the radar uh, for the nomination. And no, I never, I mean, not only did I not think that I would be the archivist of the United States as, as a little girl. I mean, I didn't think I would be the archivist of the United States, you know, I don't know, three years ago, if you had said that to me, you know, even, you know, a few months before I was nominated, your life is going to take this turn and then you're going to find yourself, you know, running a federal agency and you're going to run, you know, you worked at the Library of Congress, but the National Archives is always viewed as the other counterpart to the Library of Congress and you're going to become the head of that other agency. Never in a million years did I think that my life was going to take that turn. And I try to every day that I wake up, or no matter where I'm at, if I'm here in State College or I wake up in my house in Arlington, Virginia, and I'm going to work in Washington, D.C., or if we're somewhere else in the country visiting one of our National Archives sites, I try to, I do, I pinch myself and I say, hey, how lucky you are to be in this role. There are challenges. Not every day is necessarily the best day. There are challenges, but what an opportunity to be able to engage in public service at this moment in time. 
and in this role and also, you know, being the first woman to be able to do this. Uh, you know, I'll t take a moment to talk about that just briefly. I mean, there are women that work in these institutions, in libraries, in archives, in museums. Uh, that is actually a female-dominated field in, in working in uh, those types of, of institutions, not just in Washington, D.C., I mean all across the country, local museums, local archives, things like that, and libraries. Um, but there are, up until maybe 10 years ago, there wasn't very many women that ran any of these institutions, not just at the federal level, but even, uh, you know, in cities and, and localities. And we've really seen that change uh, in the past decade and how important that is uh, that we have that, that leadership and those role models for other women who are working in these institutions. Uh, I, I really think it does matter. If I could follow up on that um, last point a bit um, about the significance of being the first of the changes that you've seen in the past decade or so, um, tell us a little bit about how you see those changes happening and maybe some everyday relevances that, you know, but for the women, that the fact that women are being able to do this. I think, you know, I think that women have, you know, been, like I said, been working in these institutions for a long time, but they hadn't risen, you know, to, to actually be running those agencies. Some of it is that now women have the experience that would be relevant to running those agencies. But let's face it, I mean, it's because there are, uh, there's opinions in, that have been changed about the role that women can play in, in leadership in these institutions. I'm sure there were many, many qualified women before in previous decades and previous generations. They could have run these institutions, but they weren't, uh, they didn't, uh, you know, for whatever, whatever reason, uh, either they didn't feel like they were in the environment to raise their hand, to be uh, considered for those roles, or they were just simply, you know, passed by because uh, there were, there were um, you know, because of sexism or because of views about their capabilities. I, you know, what for? I mean, there's a lot of things. Um, you know, one thing, when I came on board, there was, we have subject matter experts at the archives. Most of our archivists work more generally in our collection, but we do have subject matter experts for particular areas in our collection. For example, we have a subject matter expert for African-American records. We have subject matter uh, uh, experts for military records, uh, for uh, Native American records. Um, I was, you know, I, had, I was starting, archives is a really big place, but a few months in, I guess they drew straws from the senior leadership to tell me, I, I actually just assumed, but they did not have a subject matter expert, an archivist who specialized in women's history and records related to women's history. So someone finally told me that they didn't. And I said, um, that has to change immediately. They said, oh, yeah, we know we're, we're on it. We're working on it. So they, they wanted to tell me that they were posting the position, uh, that that was going to come online and, and they were ready to post it. So that was terrific because if we don't have a subject matter expert in that area, when we have scholars that come that want to research women's history or subjects related to women's history, and they don't have an archivist that they can speak to specifically about that area, yes, we have other people that can help them for sure, but it's also going to be, that person can be a point of contact for them as they navigate the records. And we'll also know a little bit more about the scholarship in those areas uh, to be able to be responsive uh, to that request. So there's all kinds of, of ways in which uh, it really makes a difference. I think talking to younger people, whether we have people that are interns that are at the National Archives that are undergraduates or graduate students, or we have people, young people who are working at the National Archives, to be able to be that role model as well. And, ex and they can see that and know that they too can come to either lead a place like, you know, either the National Archives itself or a place like the National Archives, that's really transformational. Certainly, I had a lot of, you know, I was very lucky when I was uh, an undergraduate and a graduate student. I had, you know, dissertation advisors and undergraduate thesis advisors and professors and other mentors in, in my jobs who were all uniformly men. They were almost all uniformly men, but they were, they were advocates for, for women and women holding these roles. Um, but isn't it great to be able to have women in those roles to be mentors as well? Uh, and I think that's very important. 
Thank you. It's, it, it puts into light the whole process of what it means to raise your hand to say, can I be considered for this? And should I be considered? And am I, am I willing to take the risk? And how did, how did that happen for you? Can, can you tell us about the nomination process, the confirmation right. process? Right. So my, my name had gotten on the radar because I had served. Um, well, first, I you know, uh, was working at the White House Historical Association. So, you know, I was doing work there um, and, you know, you work very closely with the White House, oftentimes with different facets of the White House. But in previous administrations, a lot of times we had worked often with the Office of First Lady. So, um, you know, I'd been working in our educational and historical area of the White House Historical Association. So it was a known quantity there. I had also served as the vice chair of the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission and um, had made a lot of contacts uh, in that service and, you know, been able to get my name out even just beyond where I had worked at the Library of Congress previously. And so that sort of changed a little bit of, of the people that knew me uh, in Washington, D.C. as someone who worked in, you know, that was known as someone that could work in nonpartisan areas that had expertise in areas of uh, related to history, even though I'm a political scientist. A lot of my work has been historically informed. And, you know, what happens, you know, eventually someone passes your name along to the White House nominations team. And then if they're interested and they look at your resume, then you get an email from the White House nominations team saying, we want to interview you. We want to talk to you about a position, a presidentially nominated Senate confirmed position, in this case, you know, to be the archivist of the United States. And there were, you know, a series of interviews with the White House nominations team and other people. Uh, related to the White House, you know, that that talked with me. And um, eventually, you know, they winnow it down to where there's, in my case, I think there were two people being considered for the role at, you know, towards the very end. And then it really gets serious because then you go through all kinds of um, interviews with lawyers concerning ethics considerations and and really a, a deep dive into, you know, all your financial records you have to turn over all kinds of things that they request from you, um, all kinds of background checks uh, that you have to go through. I mean, I think I spent um, eight hours with um, uh, lawyers from the nominations team. We did them in two-hour increments where they really go over your entire life and ask you all kinds of questions about not just your career, but how you've really just lived your life, I mean, and how you've conducted your life. You go through that. And then you know, you, I kind of, you're trying to ask these questions, um, like, am I, is, am I the nominee or is there someone else, you know? And they're very cagey about that. They really move you along in, in a segmented process. And then it eventually, at some point in time, you have to fill out a ton of, I mean, just an, an inordinate amount of paperwork. I can't even describe how much paperwork it is. And it's not just from you, it's from, from your spouse. I mean, all of my spouse's financial records, all of his employment history, everything. Um, every, you know, investment that you own, everything has to go forward to the White House. So you have to be willing to do this. And I imagine that maybe some people, you know, get to this point and they're like, hey, this is not that I have anything, maybe that they have anything to hide, but they just don't want to go through this process. I can't tell you how many weekends I spent going through documents and, and getting things ready so that the White House would have um, what they needed. And then eventually at the end, you kind of figure maybe you are the, per although they never really tell you that you maybe are the nominee because you have to do things like you go to the Department of Justice to be fingerprinted. And then you're thinking, well, OK, if this is pretty serious if they're taking my fingerprints um, at the Department of Justice. I'll, you know, like how many people are they really fingerprinting for this job? Um, you know, what's what's going on? But you never really know um, until the very end. And finally. Someone said to me, you're only one step away. And I said, well, what, what is the step? Like, what's the, you know, like, what's behind the ne this next door? I don't know. Um, the president needs to sign off on your nomination. The president actually approves every nomination that goes forward. We put that in front of him. He has to sign off on it. And then if he signs off on it, then you will, then we'll figure out a public rollout for, for the nomination. And then one day I was, I'm not kidding you, I was sitting in a meeting, a meeting at work at the White House Historical Association. We were actually holding a teacher uh, training seminar. It was, you know, in the summertime. It was in July. And I was in a group with a whole bunch of people and we had all the teachers there and they were, we were doing our training program. And I looked at my phone and I saw what the number was and I was like, okay, I think I better. I, so I got up and, and excused myself. 
and went outside and took the phone call. And it was the White House. And they said that the president had looked at my nomination this morning and he had signed off on it. And so if I was willing that I was going to become the nominee and they would announce it in about a week's time. But up until then, I'm not allowed to say anything because the president formally announces the nomination. So you can tell, you know, your spouse, you can tell your very immediate family, no friends, you know, nobody else. Now, my boss knew at the White House Historical Association, because you can kind of imagine that's kind of like a, you know, like a, a small, you know, short walk between, you know, uh, those are the same circles. So eventually I was able to tell him before the nomination was announced, so he wasn't surprised by it. But other than my boss and my father and my spouse and my brother, that was it. Those are the only people that knew um, the day before the day before the nomination was announced. Um, so it's an it's an incredible process. Um, a lot of people that I talk about with it in Washington D.C. I know a number of people that have been nominated for various positions, not all for heads of agencies, but for you know boards and commissions. And a lot of them say that they wouldn't go through it again because it's it's you know it is it's it's arduous. It's not a simple process. That's only the beginning. Then you get, then you're in front of the Senate. You know that's only the the getting the nomination, and then there's the whole congressional process. Mm -hmm.